You're listening to Numerically Speaking, the Anaconda podcast. On this podcast, we'll dive into a variety of topics around data, quantitative computing, and business and entrepreneurship. We'll speak to creators of cutting edge open source tools and look at their impact on research in every domain. We're excited to bring you insights about data, science, and the people that make it all happen. Whether you want to learn about AI or grow your data science career, or just better understand the numbers and the computers that shape our world, Numerically Speaking is the podcast for you. Make sure to subscribe. For more resources, please visit anaconda.com. I'm your host, Peter Wayne. Hello, and welcome to um, the podcast. And um, I really, I'm just so glad to, um, to, to welcome Vicky Boykis on here with, with us. We're really honored to have you on the show. And um, while uh, some in our audience uh, may already know you, many are probably already familiar with you, um, but can you quickly share just a bit of background on who you are and, and what you do uh, for, for those who are not familiar, and maybe tell us a little bit more about, uh, about Tumblr and about Automatic. Sure. Thank you so much for having me, Peter. I'm, I'm so excited to do this. Um, so like you said, I'm Vicky Boykis. I am a machine learning engineer at Tumblr, um, which is part of Automatic. So Tumblr itself is, as I describe it, the anti-social media, social media platform. Um, it's been around for 15 years now. Wow. Um, and it's, um, there's no one single way to describe it, but a, a good way would be it's a home for artists. It's a home for creators. It's a where place you can express yourself. Um, and it's part of Automatic, which is the larger company that owns um, companies such as WordPress.com, Day One, and WooCommerce. And it's basically um, all about making the web a better place, a place to express yourself, a place where you can sell and create your content. That's that's fantastic, um, and uh, and you you called the did you say anti social social media? <laughs> that's the way I like to describe it, anti social social <laughs> media. Um, yeah, so one of the cool things about it is um, you don't have to use your real name. Um, there's a lot of artists, there's a lot of creation going on, um, mm -hmm. and the way our users like to think of it as kind of like a, also a stream of consciousness. So. Right, right. I so I I'm sure we'll come back to this topic later. Um, but this idea of actually having a free space to be who you are or to express yourself um, uh, may actually make it, it's a different kind of socialization. And one might say the amplification platforms that we're familiar with today, uh, the ones on which you and I are so famous, perhaps, but still, those are actually more antisocial in certain regards, right? They certainly incentivize a lot of antisocial behavior, unfortunately. But we'll get into all that later. But maybe to start off with, I will just seize on something you said. You call yourself a machine learning engineer. And did you always call yourself that? Or at some point, you know, didn't, didn't you call yourself a data scientist at some point? Or was it always ML engineer? Yeah, so it's been it's been an interesting evolution. Um, my background is actually in economics, which I think is true mm. for a lot of people in the data industry. Um, uh, probably like the two most common jobs this year, economics and physicists. Um, we love to congregate in data. <laughs> um, and I actually started as a data analyst and um, kept running up against this thing where I had to do more and more software development. And I found that at first um, I wasn't too interested in it. Um, but then I basically saw what software development could do. So I think the first job I had, um, I was basically an economic analyst. So I actually graduated with a job in my major, which I think is pretty rare. Um, and mm -hmm. I had to analyze some data from the World Bank and it was on the World Bank website. And I was taking a row and it was in like this horrendous columnar format that you see in all open source data everywhere. So I would just take a row at a time, highlight it, copy it and paste it into my Excel sheet. Um, and then someone showed oh. me at work, they're like, did you know that you could scrape this data with a Python script? And I'm like, what? Um, and so once I saw that you could do that, I thought I'm all in, I'm all in on what this entails. Nice. Um, and then I went on to do more and more progressively programming things. So I did go into data science then after data analysis. Um, mm -hmm. And then at one of my jobs, I had the fortune or unfortune to be placed on a team that was being introduced to Hadoop at the time um, as, <laughs> as a data scientist. And um, I started writing, it was at the time, pig scripts. So there's this meme going around Twitter, tell me how old you are without telling me how old you are. So one of the right. things I did was pig scripts, um, which was like the original data science. Um, and then I thought, this is really cool. How can I do more with this? How can I get more involved with this? And so I moved progressively more and more towards from um, kind of 
looking at the data side of things to actually creating and programming this these systems. And I think mm-hmm. in a way that's where um, the entirety of data is headed. Um, not that everybody is writing code or fortunately interacting with Hadoop, um, but it is getting <laughs> to a point where I think we started in data science where everybody was kind of doing these analyses, these one-off analyses, Excel, R, et cetera, um, just on their machines. And they got to the point where, oh, okay, this is a really cool thing. We can make it part of a product. How can we actually build this into our application? How can we build recommendations in our application? How can we build these machine learning models? And, and so I think everybody is kind of getting to the point where we're moving closer and closer to what we consider to be Um, software development and production environments. And so I think my career progression has hopefully not um, just like a one-off bias, but has reflected where the industry is headed as a whole. Right, right. Well, and and what's interesting about that is the, we look at this and we say, well, as data science goes from exploration to producing things that are part of production, production applications and, and, and whatnot, um, Data science has to mature in certain ways, right? Um, to to kind of meet the standards of software engineering and what what the people who operate these systems and get paged at like two in the morning, like what they would expect from a certain level of quality and and whatnot, and that all makes sense. But um, but you know, in, in life, uh, everything changes everything else. So, what are the ways that the requirements of these data systems, these online prediction systems, the different systems? What are ways that you're seeing these change how software engineers in traditional application development who are used to writing like CRUD apps or little database things or little whatever things, um, as they start looking at these giant data-driven things uh, and deploying them, how does IT and software, how does it change or how have you seen it change or or maybe reluctantly or try to refuse to change? Tell me about that part of the interaction. Yeah, I think there's a really interesting interplay between what we consider traditional software development and what Mm -hmm. we now see in machine learning or data-driven development as a whole. And so, like you said, so the traditional development uh, life cycle is what? So you have a CRUD app where you're developing a feature. Um, Let's say you're developing a toggle to do X, Y, and Z in your app. So what do you do? So you develop this toggle, you test it, you have unit tests, does this toggle work on and off, et cetera. Um, You launch it, you put it behind a feature flag, and that's it. You're done with creation feature. It can be pretty open-ended in some ways. Um, Is this the right framework to use? Do I need to architect this toggle to be able to be hit a million times a second? Whatever. But in general, it's pretty closed-ended. And the way that data development works, it's very open-ended. It's very different because how how does machine learning work? So you have some data. You have to spend a generous amount of time, 80 low, low ball bar estimate, um, cleaning it, getting it ready for features, getting it ready to be part of a model. Then you create the first iteration of your model. And that might be a good model or it might be a bad model. What does it mean for it to be a good or a bad model? Maybe it could be classifying things correctly um, or it could be classifying things incorrectly um, or it could be serving you recommendations. What does it mean for a recommendation to be good or bad? It could be good for you. It could be bad for the platform, et cetera. It could be good in general. It could be um, bad in general as well. So what does it mean for the results of a model to be good or bad? Um, obviously, there has to be human in the loop evaluation on that. Um, and then mm-hmm. do you do a second pass at this model? So maybe you do. Um, then you create more results from this model. Is this a good model? Is this a better model than the first model? And so um, if we do have a be- what we consider to be a bad model for whatever metrics we follow, whether they be offline metrics on model fit, precision recall accuracy, or online metrics or people clicking on the results of this model, um, we might need to go back and collect more data. Or it might Mm -hmm. be that this works and then um, the data that we're collecting changes. Someone starts logging something differently. All of a sudden we have null values for certain features. Um, And so then the model doesn't work anymore. So the machine learning model, the process of creating a machine learning product is a lot more open-ended. And I think that where we bump up into the traditional constraints of software is software says this works or it does not or you get an exception, that's it. Right, right. Um, with machine learning, you also get exceptions. You get a lot of exceptions, a lot of YAML validation errors. Um, mm-hmm. But you also have this thing where there's a lot more human judgment that you put into the system. And I think that um, we're just starting to figure out how to make space for that in the development cycle. 
Right, right. Now that all that all makes sense to me. I mean, the, the way I see it, um, a traditional software developer has the luxury of being able to specify what correctness is in general. You start knowing what correctness is, kind of. I mean, you spend a lot of time trying to get the business requirements nailed down, so that does take time. Um, but once that has sort of been moved semantically from the business domain into some kind of um, a specification or something like that, a technical specification, you can then build systems that then have, you know, whatever inputs, but, but you know, if it's, it's right or wrong, but with um, data, uh, data of what, what I, I call them value dependent systems, right. That, you know, even just the, you know, you imagine when you give a coding test to someone, you know, Hey, you write a function that reverses a linked list, or you write a function that adds a list of numbers or something. And, um, and there's a correctness aspect to it that once you write that function, the function is correct regardless of the values in the list, sort of, right? But then all the data people know, no, actually, you can write a function and it's right for some values and wrong for other values. And holy crap, how do we build an entire production system where every piece has this kind of a wiggle to it, right? And that is incredibly difficult. Um, and I think, you know, this is, I'm going to go on a limb here, but I suspect also that this intrinsic complexity of building ML systems and deploying ML systems is obscured sometimes by a cultural um, impedance mismatch between the kinds of people who are often building these systems versus traditional people who are building database applications and sort of you know business software app kind of things. Um, because you're right, they're economists, they're like washed up physicists, they're people who come from this data world and they end up being data uh, or ML app builders and so, like, at least what I found doing consulting 10 years ago, there was definitely a bit of like, you know, like, you're not from around here, are you? Kind of like experience when you met up with a whole room full of Java architects, right? And you're like, no, I haven't read all the books, or I can't speak all the Java architect, you know, lingo. But I'm telling you, this is a thing you have to solve. And this is actually really hard, not because I'm an idiot, but because it's really hard. And that is actually sometimes hard to, it's, um, you know, all these computer systems are the result of humans interacting with each other and humans, tribes of humans form tribal sort of identities and all sorts of like, um, you know, baggage, right? That, that makes this difficult. Have you seen that, um, it, you know, kind of in your experience, do you see any flavor of that? Yeah, I think something that you touched on, like the human aspect, um, I think it can be sometimes hard to reconcile the fact that all of the data that we're working with to put on into these systems is human generated data for the most part, unless you're dealing with, I don't know, like statistical control in factories, et cetera. Um, but even then humans play a part of that process because humans built those factories. And so there's definitely, right. um, there's a shape to the data. There's a flavor, there's a nuance, there's a way to understand this that is inherently, like you said, at odds with um, traditional software development, which is we have a functional spec, we put data in, we get something out. We don't really care about what we put in and what we get out. And if you, you notice that it's true, like when you do unit testing for traditional software, right? We only care that this function works and it's not a, fo it's not a focus or you're not supposed to have like a lot of data that you mock out because the idea is just <laughs> right. the function works. Well, you're supposed to test, you're supposed to test extreme values or like yes. certain kind of error conditions. Right. Right. But you're not supposed to test like you have 10 potential values for this. What happens with this? What happens with this? Right, um, right. But you do need to pay more attention to that in machine learning as well. And I think uh, like, yeah, these two different mentalities is something that I thought about a lot. Um, when we're doing software engineering, we care about building things that data can just pass through easily. When we're doing machine learning, right. we care about the data itself just as much. And I think those two things both complement and are at odds with each other. Yeah. So there's a, there's this absolutely, um, there's this amazing quote from uh, Jim Gray that I'm going to try to find here. Um, uh, here. I, I just presented this. Uh, well, I've been presenting this for a long time because you always, you can make yourself sound really smart by quoting smart people. This is a cool trick. <laughs> <laughs> it's a cool, cool conference uh, stop, talk trick, but um but Jim Gray has this uh, really great quote, and he said, what is it? Um, uh, the, the separation of data and programs is artificial. One cannot see the data without using a program, and, when most, program, and most programs are data-driven. So it is paradoxical that the data management community has worked for 40 years to achieve something called data independence, 
a clear separation of programs from data. And and when I read that, you know, however many years ago, it sort of blew my mind in the sense of like, oh yeah, no, you're right. Like we build database systems or, you know, Hadoop, pig scripts, whatever it is, or it just could be an Oracle standard, you know, you know, bog standard SQL database. But we have a, a data management, a program that does data management that's independent of the data. And there is some regime where software that is data independent is still useful. It's useful because it's better than pen and paper. It's better than people calling each other up. Okay, so it's a little bit useful in that regard. But now we're going into a world where we're realizing, oh, data sensitive, value dependent computing programs that, that are the synthesis of code and data are incredibly powerful, undeniably you know, uh, impactful. But we have absolutely no theory as an industry to, to manage this really. We're just trying to figure this out. Um, and I think you you used this quote before where you said that um, we're still in the what the, the steam powered days of machine learning, right? Um, so so do you what do you think will de demarcate the the end of the steam powered era and the beginning of the fossil fuel era or something like that or I don't know what <laughs> what is the post steam fuel? I guess that was also fossil fuels, nuclear powered uh, ML. Yeah, I think uh, I don't know. I think the we're getting to a point. So just to back up and give a little bit of context <laughs> to history. So um, we had this era where we had compute that was close to storage, right, in yeah. a traditional database system. Then we took those traditional database systems apart because um, storage became very cheap and transferring data over the network also became cheap. So it was easy to separate them and create um, like the HDFS, data lake, et cetera, S3 area. You just throw everything that you have in there and kind of let Spark sort it out, right? So that was mm -hmm. like the past, I don't know. I don't even know where how time moves in you know the data science machine learning <laughs> life cycle anymore. So that was like the past 10 years. Now we're getting to the point where people are like, okay, we have these systems separately, but now we want to keep them close together. Um, mm -hmm. so now we're seeing the bundling, like who was it that said everything is either you make money in either yeah. bundling All or business is bundling or unbundling. Right. Right. Yeah. And the same right. with data too. So we started bundling it. Then we unbundled everything. We put it in MongoDB, um, or we put it in HDFS and then we just had our program sorted out. And now we're getting put to the point where, oh, we have a lot of stuff that's unbundled all over the place. Now we want to keep a close eye on it. So now you have technologies um, like Delta Lake, for example. Um, Postgres just released um, a machine learning module where you can do machine learning mm -hmm. in the database itself. Um, right. DuckDB is a way to kind of like move the database to machine learning. So there's different theories on how mm -hmm. this is happening, but I see all of this is moving closer together. And then there's also a larger amount of architecture going on around these systems. So MLOps, obviously everyone's talking about MLOps, everyone's doing MLOps. Right. Um, so now you have MLOps, which is like, okay, we had these systems in the wild. Maybe we want to now manage them like we manage actual software and write actual software and you have monitoring and you have this and this. But I don't think we still know entirely how to do it. Um, but right. we're working to the point where, again, back to like what I was talking about with where my career is headed, um, we're working to the point where we're getting closer and closer to software engineering. We don't know exactly how it'll be different yet, but we're starting to congeal <laughs> with data and right. together. Well, so because this is the um, – because this podcast is called Numerically Speaking, numerically speaking, um, we can be a little bit more opinionated. Uh, and as an ex-physicist, we can, you know, we have the physicist conceit we can always bring to the table and say, you know, the software engineers don't know what they're doing either because they will, the senior software architects will be the first to tell you software is architecture before the arch, right? It's still, it's also, um, one of my favorite quotes about software is that, um, you know, science advances uh, by scientists stand on each other's shoulders, software developers move forward by standing on each other's toes, right? And that's <laughs> essentially layers and layers of bandages that basically uh, it's like sedimentary compress into becoming substrate. Uh, and because the poor hardware engineers work late into the night to make things faster, they spend all these t all this time making these a little bit faster. And then we just throw like another VM abstraction on top of it because why not? Right. Um, because we can't be bothered to read the docs. Right. And so I feel like even as we're saying, we want to make this stuff more and more robust. We want to figure out how to productionize it. Um, I don't think that the way people productionize software, it should be the gold standard. I don't think it's really all, I don't think that's very great on that side of the, the world either. So 
maybe we can find our, a, a, a golden path, a middle path between these different worlds. But I think certainly there are some um, uh, just intrinsic hard constraints that the data world uh, brings into this. And, and this is why personally, I like to, to try to use the word cybernetic more often because these are control systems. These are sensing systems, prediction systems, control systems. And um, as we deploy ML to the edge more and more, we'll find that the sensor plus the sensor training action, sort of the OODA loop in the edge is going to become a bigger, bigger part of people's architectures, um, especially as we have data privacy, if we go to federated learning and things like that, you're not going to be able to pull it all together to some gigantic data center. You're going to figure out actually new application prediction architectures that work when they're federated at the edge. Um, so I, I just, I, I really want to make sure for people who are listening um, that, you know, we, we're, we still hold, we hold on to our own sort of set of values around this. Those of us who, who uh, uh, are mathematically inclined. Um, so, so yeah, well, the, the other thing I want to ask you about sort of um, around some of the stuff. So the, the high level, this cons consolidation of computer storage um, and, and the emergence of ML ops. Uh, of course, there's a lot of conversation around the, the modern data stack and, and there's all, you know, great, great um, data Twitter threads about some of the stuff, mocking it, talking about it seriously. Where, where do you think, why, why is there such a Cambrian explosion of not even just like projects and companies, but even like entire categories, right? Um, right now, it seems like there's more now than there was before. What is it COVID? Is it more people showing up on Twitter and it passed some <laughs> threshold? What is it? When you're talking about categories, you're talking about um, <laughs> like what the modern data stack is or just generally kind of like these classifications. Yeah, like like ML. Yeah, so so the data, the modern data stack set of conversations are around. I mean, that sits a little bit more squarely in data engineering, right? The intersection of data engineering and data science, let's say. But then ML ops and all the the cube flow and all the other kinds of things like that's in a kind of a different space. That's the intersection of data science and uh, more of like IT and software development and software deployment, right? And then there's then there's there's there. I, I actually saw the word deep ops, right? So for <laughs> operationalizing deep learning. Don't laugh. It's not nice. We don't laugh at people when they use terms like this. We try to understand where that's coming from, right? Because actually most of the ML ops stuff for, is, is container-based and that's notoriously difficult to do GPUs very yeah. well with those things, yeah. right? So do we need different IAS providers to do deep learning operations or is it different? Like, so all these startups coming in, VCs throwing money at them, new terms are being minted faster than Gartner can even make quadrants. And at the end of the day, you know, where, do, where does someone even get started? How do they even know what is good and what is what is crap or what's hype? Like what what give us some clues here? Yeah, I think I think a lot of this is um, well, not a lot of it, but some of it is partially due to the way we do compute now, which is in the cloud, right? Mm -hmm. So the way we used to do um, compute and software development and data analysis um, was that so for data analysis we do locally, software development we would have a monolith. Right, you would have a big monolith. You would work on that monolith mm -hmm. together. Um, now everything is being broken up, right? So now, what do you do if you have a monolith? You have to break it up into microservices, um, for some definition of have to. Um, and so now, what we have is we have a lot of and what are microservices, right? And so if we're in the cloud, what it means is you have this service that does this. You have this service. You're basically gluing different things together. Right. So mm -hmm. we had the monolith. We broke it apart into microservices. Now, what do we have? We have 10 different services for machine learning that you have in AWS or GCP. And you're just basically right. trying to get them to talk to each other. So I think a lot of this comes out of the fact that you now have you now need a holistic view into these systems. And like you said, machine learning systems are very, very complicated, um, maybe even more complicated than software systems because of all the nuances that you mentioned. And especially because mm -hmm. we need to have humans in the loop at some point for a lot of these systems evaluation um, with data specific privacy, GDPR, all of that stuff, federated um, privacy, yeah. all of that stuff. Um, and so what happens is people are, I think a lot of this comes out of the fact that people are trying to wrap their mind around like this whole system in some way and try to control and reason through and reason their way through this whole system as it applies to their entire stack. And that's where I think a lot of mm -hmm. these startups come in. That's where this management, we have a lot of layers like software development today. You might be working with 
I don't know, 10 different layers, context switching between three or four different languages at a time. And so I think this is a way to try to like, get a handle on all of that. Right. I, I think maybe, um, and maybe the the way to think about it is that a lot of, I mean, coming from a point of empathy, a lot of people end up, I mean, they could be uh, very um, tenured in a particular area of software development and the world's changed around them. There's just like 10 different new things they have to consider. Or they could be relatively junior and they haven't had, like me, you know, 30 years to understand the fundamentals of computing from like 8086 up, right? So they're just trying to figure out, you know, the Linux bits here, the Kubernetes bits there, front end bits here, some linear algebra there. It's a lot, right? It's a lot to bake in and understand. And so, um, I, I so so coming from a point of empathy, when people just uh, are getting hurt by all these different things <laughs> and they're stumbling in the dark on tables they don't even they can't even name, they're stubbing their toes on furniture they can't see. So they just give names to baskets of pain, right? It's like okay, <laughs> this part of the room I call something, and, they, and they're always called ops, right? Because if, it, if we actually know what we're doing, we call it engineering. So this basket of pain, we call something ops. This other basket of pain is some other ops. And then we just got to do, yeah. Um, and every now and then you just torch the whole thing with like, you know, blowing away your NPM modules, your node modules. Anyway, um, so uh, one thing when we were kind of um, chatting before about some topics, um, one thing that came up was I, um, I reflected that I really enjoyed reading your uh, newsletters and your sub stack uh, and, this, and the norm core stuff because you took a very – um, a very candid, I would say, a very sort of sensible, like, look, I don't think you need all this stuff. And here's what I do. And this works. And, and I find that in, in um, as this industry is, um, as more people are coming into this part of the industry or as, you know, machine learning uh, absorbs more and more things, uh, there's a lot more posturing. There's a lot more like people coming in, taking social media, like uh, trying to use social media as a way to build their careers or to hype their startup, hype some tech. Certainly, for me, very disturbing is this uh, creating GitHub, like vanity GitHub repos, right? Or doing some activity, uh, you know, in the open source space, not out of a genuine desire to create, but because like it's padding your career or padding your resume. Um, and so one of the things we talked about here is like the systems of the system of incentives around uh, community, social media, whatever, around the communications um, that we would use in the industry in the past uh, that, that the system of incentives in the commercial environment has that distorted the human ecology around open source, open data science and all these things. It, it, I think it has in the last 10 years. That's my view is something has definitely shifted. It's hard to put my finger on exactly what, but you not only just as someone in the industry, but also um, uh, someone who works at a social media company, right? Like what are your perspectives on that? You know, is it distorting? Have these technologies and tools been distorting? And if so, what are things that we might be able to do to, to kind of ground things again in reality and credibility. I think, yeah. So I think there's a couple of things going on um, around social media or just around how we talk about tech and social media. Um, one of those trends I've noticed is um, context collapse has gotten very, very big. So context collapse, um, there was a really great book about it called The Presentation of Self in Everyday Life um, by Goffman. Mm -hmm. um, basically says that individual people um, basically segregate their audiences based on where they are right. at any given time. And so in the physical world, we're able to do that really well. Like you, you would talk to your parents one way, you would talk to your children a different way, you talk to your friends a certain way. Um, and usually, or you talk to your boss a different way from that. And usually right. all of those things are different representations of yourself. And something else that's interesting is I read that um, basically your personality is a re reflection of who you're talking to at any given time. Like you don't have one hmm. single personality. It depends right, right, a lot right. on what you're talking about. Um, in the digital world, we can't do that anymore because um, on on very, very public social media, like Twitter, for example, um, you're talking to everybody at the same time. So right. whatever you say, um, if you're talking about, for example, um, open source to one audience, another audience might interpret it completely differently. So we have that sense of context collapse, um, which then leads people to either um, try to be louder than the context and make kind of like very large claims that um, generate like a lot of controversy or noise, or they um, cause people to be very bland and not for any sort of controversy at all. Um, and just basically do things like you said, where um, they create repos or they have threads like, here's how you do X and Y and Z. And the point is just 
um, like to get followers to see that you know how to do X and Y and Z without any opinion on it whatsoever. Um, right. And a lot of stuff online right now is tied to your real identity. Like Twitter, sometimes um, there's a lot tied to your real identity and a lot of people do use their real identity. So that means the stakes are very high to be also very, very high, performative. Yeah. Um, and what that's resulted in, I think, is a lot of like performative signaling as well. So I just saw, I was reading this story, I think it was yesterday, um, I saw it surface on Hacker News, where basically um, this woman felt dehumanized by a viral TikTok that was filmed without her consent. So it was just this um, guy that came up to her and gave her some flowers to hold. He said that um, he needed to fix his hair or something for a date. Um, and then he walked away and he said, these flowers are for you. Um, and this thing was being filmed the whole time and she didn't know it. And she was kind of shocked, but it went super viral because of how nice the guy was being. She said, I feel taken advantage of because um, this guy was acting not out of genuine good mm. faith, but in a performative nature. So I think there's right. a lot of element of that in whatever we do online. We think about how not only what we say, but how it will play um, in a way that, like you noted, is, is much more prevalent now, even than 10 years ago when people were blogging about stuff um there yes. wasn't as much of a potential for it to kind of get out and explode and i think people were a lot more genuine in their opinions yeah i so this is a topic i could talk about literally for hours maybe days because i think somehow we engineered and built a bunch of stuff that jammed itself in as infrastructure for human to human communications and none of the people building any of this stuff had any uh reading and not done any of the reading or the background and any of the stuff. And it, be, it was so easy. I mean, you build a web a web page, you build a message board, people get on it and they, you know, share funny pictures and they, you know, make jokes about things and, and what's the harm in that. And it's, it's sort of like giving kids a bunch of uranium or like whatever. <laughs> it was like, they're just playing around this really pretty blue metal, but you put a lot of it together and the whole thing gets vaporized. Right. So there's something around this, the, the, the way you talk about context collapse and the presentation of self the, the, the phrase that I like to use is that every conversation is a space and every humane space has consistent and um, implicit or explicit, but norms, has norms that are understood by the participants. And the problem with these um, online uh, uh, environments and communications media, so to speak, is that we don't create, there's no way to create a space or the space has shift so much you know, you know, one thread here, another thread there, um, the norms. And so what identity, what avatar you present is completely, you have no idea, right? And that's deeply stressful. When we don't know who we should be, how we should show up, that's incredibly stressful, right? Are you talking to the CEO of Megacorp? Are you talking to like, you know, social media intern who's just like upvoting your little joke you made, right? And so yeah. there's this kind of thing that's really, um, some, I don't, I mean, calling it inhumane is maybe very harsh, but it's just like something deeply inconsiderate about how this is done. And your example about that, that uh, video going viral, I, I see, I, I've seen these other things where people, they do pranks, right? And they've always been pranks. As long, I mean, like t, I remember TV shows where they would go and prank somebody or punk somebody. That's like, okay, fine. Um, the social media stuff, uh, there's, there's one where they were, um, I guess it was three three women at a gym and two of the women were just really being nasty, this third woman. And they were basically trying to troll this guy at the gym into like, you know, and he's just a random dude trying to like, he's just trying to like tell this woman like, like don't listen to them. They're just, I don't know why they're being so nasty to you and all this stuff. But they were obviously trying to prank him into doing something, you know, that would then make him the fool. And it's a, it's a bullying of a sort. Right. It is, you know, what you're doing is just creating an environment, a space in that conversation, that interaction. That space is a trap and it's entirely designed to exploit the ignorance of the other person. Uh, that they're not they're not aware they're on stage. And and that's that that is a, a kind of bullying. It's absolutely taking advantage. Um, but um, but anyway, this kind of went a little bit off of this. I, I get so passionate about this topic because it's yes. it's so obvious to me. It's like, no, let's not give children plutonium and uranium to play with because like this is actually really toxic. We need to train them to have like genuine conversations, how to actually, because if you're, I guess this is the thing that it does come down to. If you feel threatened, then you're not going to present vulnerability. You're not going to approach other people with openness. And this is then a race to the bottom. Then others will not respond in kind. And so overall, what, what sucks out of this thing, what just drains away is any kind of human to human, vulnerable, deep listening, 
actual you know, uh, interaction that, um, I guess integrity, right? Is there a way to engineer these systems to select for genuine integrity? Oh, yeah, that's that's <laughs> tough. I think, <laughs> I don't know. I'm only a machine learning engineer. Um, I think that, <laughs> I think that there's a lot of, like you said, there's a lot of social sciences that need to be built into these systems that we're just now starting to understand how to build them right. in correctly. Um, I think that, right. so I was trying to find this while you were talking about um, messaging and uh, message boards, but I read a really good book, yes, um, a couple years ago. I'll have to find the link. Um, basically, it talked about the first moderator of, um, there was an online uh, chat community that started in New York that was specifically mm -hmm. based in New York. Um, and she moderated for something like, I want to say 15 years or so. And basically mm -hmm. she was, it was an interview with her and she was a, one of the first people who um, was a, what we consider today a moderator. And she talked about the rules for her community. She really thought this through. This was in the early nineties even. Um, so it was mm -hmm. before any of this, where we had to think through what content we put on a platform. We don't, um, how to be nice to people on the platform, how to kick off offenders, how to all the stuff that we um, now right. are talking about at a large scale. It starts with like this very human thing of how do you moderate a people in a community to be nice mm -hmm. to each mm -hmm. other. Um, and I think that in smaller communities, um, this is much easier. Um, this goes back to a post I wrote, um, Good Things Don't Scale, which was about the country right. of Iceland, like why Iceland is so awesome because it's <laughs> tiny and they can make things awesome. Um, but in a large country, it's harder because you have a lot of networks, a lot of things at play, a lot of um, counteractive interests. Um, and so what does that mean? So I think what we're seeing is like we have these very large social networks, but then we have clusters. Right. And the clusters in the social networks are easier to manage. And I think that's why we have we start to see things like data Twitter or mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. modern data stack Twitter. And people can discuss <laughs> those things in, the, in their interest groups. And I think that's one of the things that makes it easier to have those civil discussions because then you start to fold in a little bit of that context collapse. Right, right. You fold in the context collapse and then you make it easier to have the norms. Like when we have technical, if you have a technical part of Twitter, then it's like, hey, here we're talking the tech stuff. Let's keep the politics out of it, keep the religion out of it because we're here to talk about some tech, right? And um, that's not to say that humans aren't political animals. That's not to say that people shouldn't you know, manifest their spiritual beliefs and, and live in accord to their personal spiritual values. But just this part of the conversation, let's just really keep it about the tech, right? Or keep it about the, the topic at hand. Um, and the, the moderation thing, you know, that is, that is a way of enforcing uh, the norms, right? What do people get their wrists slapped for? What do people get ejected from the room for? Setting those norms. And the thing is, when we look at, um, I mean, of course, the most, the recent episode with, um, well, all the discussion around free speech on Twitter and who gets banned, who doesn't, and this and that and the other, and boosting versus deboosting versus all these things. Uh, it's an attempt to um, to use formal systems and computers to enforce a deeply human thing, which is what are the norms for X group of people, right? And, you know, uh, N choose K, what are the norms for K versus the norms for N? There's no formal way. One, a, a, another great quote, um, one of my favorite, uh, most quotable computer scientists uh, is Alan Perlis. And he famously said, you cannot move from the informal to the formal via formal means. <laughs> and so human, human to human norms and the communications, like what's accepted and how do we push the boundaries together? That's a thing that a bunch of people have to decide. And there's not an algorithm for that. This is, this is my, my personal view on this. But there's also, I will reference to readers or listeners who are interested to uh, listen to a great, blog, uh, great podcast that Jim Rutt on the Jim Rutt show, he did with the creator of Slashdot. And they talked about the moderation system on Slashdot. It was a uh, community moderation, but they handed out mod points to a few people. And when you got mod points, you, you only got them every now and then. And it was a special thing that you would use to enforce and upvote, downvote certain things. It wasn't like here where everyone can stop voting, downvote, and you have mobs like suppressing things or boosting things. So anyone who's interested in this topic, I'd recommend those, those two things as well. I'm um, looking at the clock here. We're uh, running a little bit out of time. I love talking about so many more things, but... Um, but on the flip side of all this, like online stuff, um, tell me, we had, we talked about sort of in-person versus uh, remote work, right? And you had some thoughts there on how automatic as a distributed company, 
uh, and remote first company uh, manages this. And I would love to hear from you about that and, and you know, how, how you all go about doing that. Yeah, so Automatic is unique in that it's been remote and distributed from the very beginning. We've been doing it before it was cool. Um, and yeah. one of the ways that we um, used to manage it is we have um, a top-down culture and uh, bottom-up culture of written communication first. Um, and so mm -hmm. I've written about this before, but the way we communicate is um, this product called P2, which is, as you would imagine, a WordPress blog. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, basically every team in the company has a P2. You can see everybody's P2s. Um, and literally we don't send emails. Um, everything that is uh, discussion, I'm thinking about doing this project, an RFC, a retro, et cetera, all of that happens on P2s um, and people can comment on it, et cetera. And so um, what that does is two things. One, documentation, it codifies everything that you're working on. I can see all the projects that I've done um, and I'll, I'll just send you a link. Oh, here's a P2 to this, here's a P2 to that. Um, second, mm -hmm. when you're working um, internationally, so Automatic is distributed internationally, um, you might have people who are 12 hours behind you, 12 hours ahead of you, people who are working six hour time differences. Um, so Slack, you can use for that and you can use Twitter threads, um, but it kind of um, slows down the conversation deliberately in certain ways so that everybody has mm. a chance to respond at any given time because the response is a comment. So you make a comment mm -hmm. and that drives mm -hmm. a conversation in the same way that a meeting might. Um, and so I found mm -hmm. this, I, I love written culture. Um, I love P2 culture. Um, what is really interesting about it to me is that you can very clearly see what you've worked on um, mm -hmm. and you have references to every single thing you've done and you can also search through every P2 so you can clearly see what a project um, like where it came to. Now, of course, it might take you, the downside is it might take you a while to get to what you need um, because a project thread might have, I don't know, 15, 20 different comments. What if we do this? What right. if we do this? Here's the outcome. Um, so it does take deliberate filtering, but I think it's a great way to, um, to work remotely. I think it's a great way to have those conversations and to, to document stuff that's there for reference um, in an async way. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's so that um, I'm very envious of that concept of having such written culture. Certainly, it's uh, um, you know the, we hear about you know Amazon having such a culture, and we I mean internally in Anaconda, of course, people write a lot of docs. And there's collaborative editing of docs, and there's a lot of these things, and we have um, um, uh, we'll call it apes, right? So like product enhancements, Anaconda product enhancements, things like that. So there's there's these things that that we are working on, but. Um, uh, I, I just I looked at the, the P2 site. So it's wordpress.com slash P2 for anyone who's interested. Um, really looks super interesting and I would love to actually maybe try prototyping that for some of our stuff internally. Um, but that having that written culture, it does slow things down, right? And it and that's that slowdown is actually it it makes things a little more deliberate in that way. So um, that's excellent. So uh, with that, I guess one final question for you, Vicky, which is um, do you have any takes on AI and the singularity? How far out you think we are? <laughs> are you building one? My, have you guys produced uh, one yet? <laughs> I heard that a Google I, language model just became sentient. So has any of your stuff become sentient? <laughs> <laughs> Listen, Peter, I'm just trying to get my YAML to lint correctly out here. Um, yeah. It's hard enough to, to build these systems as it is. Like make sure that you have your feature store, make sure you have this, make sure you have your model, make sure you have your output. Make sure you put it in production. Um, I am not worried about the singularity anytime soon. I think we have uh -huh. a very, very long way to go. <laughs> All right. Well, well, that's a very bold uh, claim to make. I think, you know, the old joke was that, uh, you know, so-and-so, you know, I'll replace you at some point with a small Python script or a small bash script. And I, I could say now, yeah, we might be looking at a Skynet creating a, creating a sentient robot just to... Um, just to parse your YAMLs robustly. Oh, I hope so. Um, that would be if, hilarious. If that's the case, I'm all for it. <laughs> I'm all for it. <laughs> well, thank you so much for joining us. I really appreciate chatting with you. Appreciate the, the insights and perspectives, Vicky. And I will see you in uh, whatever our part of Twitter. Um, uh, uh, look forward to more conversations in the future. Um, thank you so much for joining us. Really appreciate it. Thank you. It was my pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. And for the listeners, we'll have links and references to uh, the various resources and things mentioned today. And Vicky, if you figure out that um, the the thing about that moderator of the message board, uh, definitely yep. shoot that over. So we'll, mm -hmm. we'll include that. Um, 
Um, but uh, yeah, thanks everyone for listening and look forward for our next episode. Thank you for listening. And we hope you found this episode valuable. If you enjoyed the show, please leave us a five-star review. You can find more information and resources at anaconda.com. 